So who was Jesus? Or for us believers, who is Jesus? This is a question that people have wrestled with over, uh, over 2,000 years. Ever since Jesus came and walked this earth, people have asked the question, who is this man? I'd like to talk to you about the Jesus message this morning, and I'm going to approach it a little bit different than I usually would do a sermon. And hey, you know, if nothing tried, you can only fail if you try, right? So I'm going to approach it a little bit different. I'm going to look at this essence of the gospel of John uh, through the eyes of John. So we're going to kind of peruse the book of John, and we're going to try to understand how John put this book together, how he put the book together so that we would pay attention to the message of Jesus. And so if it kind of seems a little different than most sermons, it's because it probably is. You see, John was different than the other three synoptic gospels. Matthew wrote for the Jews. He had them in mind and he emphasized Jesus of Nazareth and he emphasized that Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies so that they would believe that he's the king of kings. And then Mark wrote for the Gentiles. He, he, he wrote those busy Romans and he presented to them the suffering servant who met the people's needs. Luke wrote his gospel mostly for the Greeks. And he kind of introduced Jesus as a sympathetic son of man who, who emphasized, and emphasized the humanity uh, Jesus had. But John, he writes for both the Jews and the Greeks. John takes them both on. He, he says, I'm going to bring something, news about God. And he wants to emphasize Jesus is divine. And so he chooses all the stories. He selects all his metaphors and the miracles that he describes. He selects him to communicate this one message of who Jesus is. Whereas the first three Gospels describe events in the life of Jesus. When we read John, we see him describing the meaning of those events. We see him describing the theology behind those events. In other words, John's gospel is not so much biographical as it is theological. He has a theological argument that he wants to present and he uses every event and statement and every miracle to bring us this Jesus message. For John, you see, the message of Jesus is that Jesus is the message. Do you get that? Do you understand that? He insists that we have to believe in Jesus, have a relationship with Jesus, know Jesus, experience Jesus, even eat and drink Jesus. I love the choir singing, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. That's what John would say. And so it's helpful for us to understand that John was also writing for the sec to the second generation Christian. And what I mean by that is that John was the last living disciple. John was the last living link with those who had known Jesus, who, as, as he wrote in 1 John, had touched Jesus had seen Jesus, had eaten with Jesus, those who had literally been in Jesus' presence. He was the last living link between those who had already died and those who had never seen Jesus in the flesh, that second generation believer. And so John's gospel is this transition point between the generations who knew Jesus personally and those second generations who only would know them through the testimony of others. Which means that for John, it was important that his gospel came forward for us today, for us who have never seen Jesus. It's important. His gospel means, and I think maybe that's why when you talk to people more people have read the book of John than any other gospel. I think when you talk to preachers and they, they bring somebody to Jesus for the first time, the first book of the Bible they ask him to read is the book of John. Because there's something about the book of John that helps us who've never seen Jesus and helps us understand why 
John records the words of Jesus to doubting Thomas. Remember his words? Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And those words ring so true to us who've never seen him in the flesh. And with this in mind, I find it fascinating to notice that the stories and the miracles John chooses to tell the story of Jesus were all absence of Jesus' touch. You know, many times we t hear about where Jesus touched the leper. There was none of those kind of miracles taking place in the book of John. Jesus, when he did his miracles, did not ta touch. And I think there's a reason why John chose those particular miracles. Whether it was turning the water into wine, his first miracle that John talks about in Canaan, or whether it was a royal official's son who Jesus just spoke, and even a, not even in the proximity of Jesus, that son was healed. Or whether it's a paralytic by the pool of Bethesda, and Jesus merely says, take up your bed and walk. Or whether it's Lazarus who's in the tomb. And Jesus doesn't go in and lay beside him and touch him. He calls out, Lazarus, come forth. And for a second generation believer, I think these miracles mean a lot because they say to us, and the message is clear, that the power of Jesus' words overcome the power of time and space. That the power of Jesus' words is good, as good as his touch. That the power of Jesus' word he, is as good as his pres personal presence. His word is as powerful at a distance as it is close at hand. And we can trust in the power of his word. Not just his word that he speaks, but John wants us to know that we can trust in the power of his word. The written word also. So I think Paul picks up this idea. And you know that over in Romans, uh, Romans, he talks about Romans 10. He says, consequently, faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. In fact, a case can be made from the book of John that the presence of the Holy Spirit today in this world is more important to the believer than the presence of Jesus in the flesh. John wants us to understand that while we all would love to see Jesus and touch Jesus, that because Jesus went to heaven, we have an advantage that's beyond his physical presence. Isn't that what John says? He says, I consequently, he says, no, oops, I went blank. He says, I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counsel will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I'm thankful that Jesus went back to heaven. I'm thankful that his presence in person isn't here because he sent his comforter. He sent his spirit who is everywhere with his church, everywhere in the world today, working on our hearts and drawing us to Christ. I want you to know that just as every good speaker tries to have an opening good line, and I couldn't think of any, so I just put a video on. But just as every single speaker wants an opening good line, John also wanted to bring an opening good line. And what was John's opening line? What did he say? In the beginning. Now, you've heard those words before, right? Where did you hear them? Genesis. And that was intentional. John wanted to take us all the way back to Genesis. I would suggest to you that all good theology goes back to Genesis. All of our theology ought to be rooted in the beginning. When there was just God, no one else. In the beginning. When God looked out and nothing existed. In the beginning. And John wants to deliberately take us to that beginning because he wants to say there's a new beginning happening. Just as there was a beginning and God created the world out of chaos, God is also going to create a new man and create a church out of the chaos of sin. At a world gone awry, God has a new creation arising. That new creation that's arising, John wants us to know it's arising right now in front of us. Your evidence sitting before me that God is doing a work of creation, a new creation that's arising in the world. It's not 
yet to completion, but it now is. Not yet, but now is. And God is doing his work as he creates his glory. See, John was not content in his gospel like Mark was, starting it with just a testimony about John the Baptist, about Jesus. He was not content like Luke was to go back to the birth narratives of, of, of John the Baptist and Jesus. No, he wanted to do more than that. He wanted, didn't even want to do what Matthew did to go to the genealogy of Abraham and, and David and kind of look at Christ's genealogy. Instead, he wanted to go all the way back to Genesis 1 in the beginning when there was just God. And then John would say in John 1, 9, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Just as in Genesis, the light shone and darkness parted. So Jesus came and the darkness began to be divided from the light. You see, Jesus is that dividing point, that new creation. And so John wants us to understand that life would emerge from this chaos. And then John uses a language that all of his audience could understand. He introduces Jesus as the Word. The Word! Now, who would have thought of that? He uses the word in the Greek, logos. He says, just as we are clear, just so we can be clear that he's referring to Jesus, just in case we wonder who this word is, he says, and the word became what? Flesh. And did what? Dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We've seen him. We've seen his glory. John calls, calls Jesus the word, and he comes with these words of truth and this person of truth. And they're unified. The word of God and the truth of God are unified in this person of Jesus. His coming, his working, his teaching, his dying. The final decisive message of God has come. To put it so simply, what God had to say to us was not what Jesus said, but it's who he is and what he did. I've already said it. The message of Jesus is that Jesus is the message. It is the message. The Greek word is logos for the Jews. And for the Jews, logos had its roots in the Old Testament. Logos communicated the power of God, the, in, the embodiment of God from Genesis to create. It was the power of creation. The logos was a, a word that for them personified that power, that, that uh, ability coming out of Genesis. In fact, Genesis 1, nine times he spoke the word and there was light and there was sky and there was ground and there's vegetation and there's sun and there's animals. The word, logos. The psalmist says this about the creative power of God's word. By the word of the Lord were the what? You know it. Heavens made. Right? Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. You see, that was to the Jews, but to the Greeks, they also loved that word logos. For them, it was more of a philosophical principle than a power. The word embodied the thought, the wisdom, the reason, the rationality, it, all the way back to 560 BC with the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. He had said, the only permanent lasting reality in the flux of constant change was logos. <laughs> the reason of God who controlled and guided the stream of change. To a Greek, the word was eternal. To the Greek, logos was the eternal word that would come close to the New Testament concept of God as, because the word sustained the universe. So logos, sustained. You almost think that maybe inspiration was kind of guiding a little bit in some of the thoughts of these philosophers. And so John begins his gospel by saying something like this, this to the Greeks, this word whom you worship, this sub is a subject of my book. Reading this book will help you understand him, know him, and serve him better. 
And these Greek readers would be drawn to want to read this book because the Logos had come to dwell among us. That guiding principle, that, that wisdom, that rationality, it's come. And so John goes to the familiar Logos theme for the G Gentile and for the Jewish, and he, and, but he goes beyond that. He stretches it beyond that because he wants to present Jesus as a personal being who is a divine and yet fully human person. Jesus was not simply a personification of God's revelation as the Jews thought he was. He wasn't just a mediating principle like the Greeks perceive, but Jesus was God the perfect revelation of himself in human flesh. So much so, God recorded Jesus' words that Jesus spoke to Philip. Remember, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you so long, anyone who has seen me has seen who? The Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Those are strong words. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. I am not more than just the personification. I am the God who you should worship. And so, to the Christian, Logos is greater than a divine power, more than a rational principle, more than a redempt, it is a redemptive proclamation that Jesus saves. Jesus was the way to God. As Jesus would say, I'm what? The way, the truth, and the life. It's a redemptive proclamation, Jesus, is the message. John goes beyond that Logos idea and Jewish Gentile readers and he presents Jesus as a personal being, divine and human, personification, but more than a personification, more than a mediating principle, a perfect revelation. Jesus was the salvation of man. And so John, in this flash of genius, uses this word Logos and communicates to different groups all groups that he knew in those days, the Jews, the Greeks, and even the new Christian audience that he was speaking, speaking to. He communicates on, he continues his communication through metaphors and stories, choosing them, and let me choose four of those. For instance, he chooses John the Baptist. When John sees him walking by, and he, what does John say when he sees Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Now, what lamb was he referring to? You know, John could have been referring to the eschatological, apocalyptic, conquering lamb of Revelation that John would later write about. He could have been talking about that lamb. In fact, Revelation 5, 6 talks about that lamb standing in the middle of the throne, looking as if it was slain. The lamb worthy to take the scroll and open the seven seals, according to verse 9 of chapter 5. The Lamb receives power in verse 12 uh, uh, and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. In fact, in verse 17 of Revelation, this same Lamb, the beasts and the kings of the earth make war against this Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome. Amen? Because He is Lord of Lord and King of kings. And with him will be his called, his chosen, his faithful followers. He could have been talking about that lamb. He also could have been talking about the submissive lamb of, Rev of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, you remember that lamb? He was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb led to a slaughter. As a sheep before his shears were slant, so he did not open his mouth. We understand that lamb from the Old Testament, don't we? We understand that lamb when we hear the story of Abraham taking his, his son Isaac to sacrifice him on the altar. We see a picture of that. And so if that lamb, if that was the picture that John wanted us to understand, if that was the lamb that John the Baptist was pointing to, then we would be wondering, he must be talking about the substitutionary death of Jesus in our place. Or it could have been the sanctuary lamb. The sanctuary lamb that Mosaic Law talks about. If this was the case, then the focus would be on Jesus as the one who fulfills the Old Testament sanctuary promises and all the promises in Israel. 
A fourth option would be what? The Passover lamb. Could be the Passover lamb in the Exodus. In this case, John the Baptist would see Jesus as the new Moses, right? He'd be the new Moses coming as the Redeemer of Israel, taking us from our land of Egypt, our land of sin, and taking us on to the promised land. I think all of these are possibilities, and maybe it was left kind of like an enigma, vague, on purpose, so that we would consider all of them. That's a possibility. However, I think if I chose one, I would choose the Passover lamb, because I think that's the most important in the book of John. You see, for John, there's a strong sense that Jesus is a new Moses. In fact, right at the beginning, he points out, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth comes by Jesus Christ. John 1, 17. Jesus turns water into wine in, in the same way that, that, that Moses turned the waters to blood in, in the Egyptians' pots. He provides bread from heaven in the same way that Moses had bread for the Israelites as they were leaving the wilderness. And then at the end of his gospel, Jesus relates Jesus' death on the cross to the regulations regarding the death of the Passover lamb. Remember in, the, in Exodus, in Exodus 12, 46, when they were talking about the Passover lamb, it said, this lamb must be eaten inside the house, take none of the meat outside, and do not break any of its bones. And so Jesus, as he hung there on the cross, John emphasizes that none of his bones are broken. They did not break Jesus' legs, according to John 19, 33. Once again, I think Paul picks up this thought when Jesus, he writes in Corinthians 5, 7, he says, for indeed, our Passover was sacrificed for us in Jesus Christ. And he kind of begins to hammer this home, this whole idea home, when John picks out the AMs. That's probably my favorite part of John. Is it for you? The IMs? Do you remember them? Are you with me? Seven I am statements in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, those I am's were always associated with the Yahweh of Scripture. In fact, the first time it was ever talked about, the first time the I am's were ever talked about was over there in Exodus 3.14, where Moses was at the burning bush and God said to Moses, I am who I am. <laughs> this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Another time, Isaiah used the word I, I am one of the many times when he, referring to Yahweh. He wanted to understand how unique God was, so he says, you are my witness. Now, this is a great scripture if you're a Jehovah's Witness, because this is their key scripture. You are my witness, declares Yahweh. He witnesses that you are my servant and I have chosen you. So you may know and believe me and understand that I am. Before no God was formed, before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am Yahweh, and apart from me, there is no Savior. I think it identifies Jesus more than it does not identify Jesus, but as that one, I am. And so the Apostle John purposely makes seven statements about this divine Jesus. He says, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light to the world. I am the door for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Notice, Jesus didn't say he gave us bread. <laughs> we could do that, but he says, I am the bread. Eat of me. He didn't say, I give you water to drink. He says, I am the water of life. He says, I am the light to the world. He says, I am the resurrection. He did not tell us that I'm bringing you resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection. I am. You see, John wants us to understand more than anything else that Jesus just doesn't have a message. Jesus is the message. He is the message. And John deliberately continues to record miracles. In fact, he has, just like the seven I am's, he has seven miracles. But it's interesting, he doesn't call them miracles. 
he calls them signs. You see, he deliberately called them signs, not terra wonders or paradoxums, paradoxes or simeon. He calls them signs. Signs. Why? You see, a sign is a miracle that carries a message with it. That's why he wants it to be a sign. He had a message he wanted to carry with it about who Jesus was, the divine son of God. You see, miracles are signs, and signs are very similar in emphasis, and they're, both are miraculous. But a miracle emphasizes the power of God, and a sign emphasizes the purposes of God. A sign is not le less miraculous, it just has a different purpose. It points to something greater than itself. But let me give you an example. I think I, what's that? That's the California state line, isn't it? What if, what if you were visiting California and you drove up to that sign, you stopped there and had your picture taken beside it and said, I finally got to California. Isn't it beautiful? And then you got in your car and turned around and went, back, turned around and went home. Would have you seen California? No, you'd only seen a sign pointing to California. California is behind the sign. Does that make sense? You see, the sign is behind, and if you just drive up and say, look kids, there's California, you would have missed California. We have to understand, I think we do, we get that. We get the fact that the greatness of California is not in the sign. We're not confused. It just points us in the right road. We know we're going the right direction. But the significance of a sign is not in the sign. It's what lies behind it. So John uses the word signs intentionally because I think he wants to point out Jesus, the divine son of God. He wants us to realize that when we see what's behind the sign, a decision will be demanded by us. And that decision will be, what do you think about Jesus? What do you think about Jesus? And let me show you how that worked. When Jesus turned the water to wine in John chapter 2, it wasn't just because his mother asked him to do it. <laughs> it was because he wanted to become a sign for the disciples. And notice what happened. John chapter 2, 11 says, This beginning of signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested or demonstrated his glory, and the disciples believed on him. Do you see that? They saw the sign and they believed on him. They looked behind the sign, they saw what was behind the sign, and it caused the disciples to make a decision, make a choice. Jesus, when he healed the nobleman's child in John chapter 4, when the man arrived home, he realized that Jesus had just spoke and his son had been healed. In verse 53 of this noble man, it says, he himself believed and the whole household was saved. In John chapter 5, verse 1 to 9, Jesus heals the man at the pool of Bethesda. He had been sick for 38 years. And verse 16 tells us this. And therefore did Jesus, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So here are some other people who made a decision about the sign. And because the sign somehow trampled on their ritual, they could not see the truth of the sign. And they made a choice against the divine God. What do you say about Jesus? Can you see it? After every miracle, there's a decision to make. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 3 to 30 to 31, our scripture reading today, the disciples saw him, it says, the disciples saw him do many other miraculous signs besides the ones recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe. And that by believing he's the Messiah, the Son of God, that by believing you will have life. See, Jesus performed these signs and the witnesses to compel us to respond in some way, in non-belief or belief, 
You cannot just hold Jesus and ignore him. Jesus is a divider in a decision you will make. Either you are for him or you are against him. Either he is who he is, the divine son of God, or he is not. And he's a liar, a lunatic. You cannot go both ways at the same time. So many other signs were performed, but John chose these. It's interesting, when John talked about the, the, the miracles of the feeding of the 5,000, you know that one, right? The feeding of 5,000. John doesn't just tell us about the story, biographically, biographically tell us about the story, but he has to tell us more. He tells us that Jesus, after that, was found preaching a sermon, saying, I'm the bread of life. When he, when he healed the blind man, Jesus didn't want to just have the blind man see. He wanted us to understand, I'm the light of the world, he declares. And when he brought his friend Lazarus back from the dead, he could have just hugged Lazarus and said, welcome back. But he knew Lazarus would die later on again. And he knew you and I would die later on again. After we were born, there comes death. And so we could have hope to realize the kingdom of God is now and yet is going to come. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. When he gave sight to the blind man, he simply didn't want to get this blind man seeing. He wanted us all to not live in darkness. He wanted us to rest and in the fact that we will live again. That even though we now have eternal life in us through Jesus Christ our Lord, that eternal life, even after death, will sustain us to the kingdom to come. This greatest sign of all, of course, was his resurrection, wasn't it? J John has a stirring eyewitness of the count. He was one of the disciples who saw Jesus raised in the tomb, and he records several post-resurrection appearances by Jesus, including one he seems to add on in chapter 21. After he kind of closes out, he adds this epilogue in John chapter 1. John unmistakably is clear, and he wants us to be clear, Jesus is the divine Son of God in whom we should believe, and he offers these compelling proofs. And let me close with one more thing he did. He offers us a, a replacement theme throughout his book. And what do I mean by replacement theme? What I mean is that many of the things that the Jewish rituals related around were replaced by Jesus. Does that make sense? Let's take a look at them right out of the gate. At the beginning, he said, the word became flesh and made his what? Dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. That idea of the word became, uh, made his dwelling, I mean, referred back to the Old Testament, pitching of a tent. In fact, it could be said, the word could be translated tabernacled. He tabernacled with us. When Jesus in Exodus 25 said, make me a tabernacle so I can dwell with you. It points back to that. Jesus is that tabernacle. He came to dwell with us. He says, the sanctuary that Herod built was not as great as the one that I am. The sanctuary that Solomon built is not as great as I am. The sanctuary of the tabernacle in the wilderness, I am. I'm the replacement. The word glory there, the Shekinah glory, we have seen his glory. We have seen his Shekinah glory. Did something go out? Oh well. We have seen his Shekinah glory and, uh, and that glory as one only who came from the Father. That Shekinah glory that dwelt in the temple is now in Jesus. Not behind the curtain. The curtain has been ripped. And you and I can see that Shekinah glory. You and I can have that Shekinah glory in us. In the form of Jesus' presence. He tended with us. And John's point is that word became flesh and eclipsed the Old Testament. We have a better revelation and that's Jesus. Jesus, several other places, says he replaces the Passover lamb. He replaces the Passover lamb. He, re he replaces the manna. He is the bread of life. He is the Passover. He is that ultimate exodus. The fullness of life, John would like us to know, dwells in him. 
And one day, he will come as a rider on a white horse who is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. He will return. Even though he's here now, and the kingdom is here now, it's also not yet. It's still to be. Now, but not yet. And John wants us to understand that we need to live this replacement now. The replacement of the water turning to wine. See, the water in those jugs, in those jars, was all about ritual, was all about religion, was all about going through the motions, the religious motions. These huge purification pots. But Jesus instructed the servants to fill those purification pots with water. And the Judaism was obsessed with this ritual of cleansing. And I think it's an indictment when they came to Jesus in John 2 and 3, and they said to Jesus, they have no more wine. I think that's an indictment to Israel, the bride. There is no more wine. I pray that that is not, a, not an indictment to the church. There is no more wine. Because there should always be more than enough wine, should there not? And Jesus wanted to show that. Show that it wasn't about the ritual of purification and the rules of religion, but it was about the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. And there's always enough to go around. And so he filled those jugs with wine. It's interesting that the, the caterer at this wedding didn't even know where the wine came from and he complains, how come they brought out the best wine now? They're not even following the customs. Sometimes we get burdened down and stuck in the customs of the church the way we've always done it. And we get stuck. And we don't get the freshness of God's newness where he says, behold, I do a new thing. I bring you a new possibility. Are we obsessed like with rituals? Or are we free to have God live out his wine in us? And when Jesus came to the pool of Bethesda, which means house of mercy, he came and he found the man paralyzed for 38 years. The Jew could not miss that. 38 years, where else was 38 years? They had wandered 38 years in a wilderness before they went to Canaan. And he was there beside the healing pool that was offered in Jerusalem. But he had been abandoned there. You see, religious systems have nothing to offer. Religious systems that he had clung to because he had no other options abandoned him beside the pool. The religious institution of Jerusalem failed in its purpose, purpose to provide mercy and healing. But what the waters of Judaism could not bring, Jesus in his mercy brought when he healed the man at the pool. What religion cannot provide, they found in Jesus. 38 years in a wilderness wandering could have been over in a moment if they could have learned that lesson in the wilderness. And I would ask you as a church, are we wandering in the wilderness? Well, let me give you just one more and we'll get out of here. Because I see I'm over. I shouldn't have looked at my watch. Yes, I should have. The Feast of the Tabernacles. Because the feasts, you know, there's a big movement for us to follow all the feasts today. But the feasts are replaced. The feasts are replaced. They're a replacement theme. The Feast of the Tabernacles, Jesus was teaching. It was, it was kind of the last of the feasts. The, the, the Day of Atonement was over. Sins were cleansed. And all around the Day of the Feast was celebration and joy. It was, a, it was a great feast. More people came to the Feast of the Tabernacle than any other of the feasts in Jerusalem. It, it celebrated the Exodus. And they would put on the temple, they, on top of the pillars, they'd put these oil bowls and light them so the temple was lit more than at any other time. And they would have processions going through the city streets with, with lit candles, oil candles, oil torches, 
They'd watch singing songs of praise. It was a great thing, a pilgrimage. They made makeshift shelters called sukkots. Can you say sukkots? Sukkots. They'd make these out of palms and they would stay in them. And, 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 and Even if you had a house in Jerusalem, you'd go on top of your house and build a sukkot and stay in it because you wanted to be reminded of this pilgrimage, of this exodus. And, and the highlight came when they did a, a rain dance. They danced throughout Jerusalem in a great procession, and the priest led this procession from the temple all the way down to the Gion Spring, chanting the words of Isaiah 3, and with joy shall you draw water from the wells of salvation. And then he would march back with his pitchers of water to the temple, and they would climb up the 15 steps into the temple, and on each step they would recite one of the 15 pilgrimage psalms found in Psalms 120, to 134. You ought to read them when you go home. Psalms 120 to 134. And then they would take these, these pitchers and they'd pour a pitcher of water in one sink and a pour a pitcher of wine in another sink. And there were pipes going down underneath that they would bring the two sinks together and water and wine would flow out all the way down to the Kindran, Kindran River. This ceremony was happening when Jesus was teaching in the temple. And Jesus got up and he said what? He said, anyone's thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, streams of living water, streams, will flow from within him. You see, Jesus replaces our feasts, our rituals with him. Because Jesus is the message. And Jesus would say to the church today, I not only want to flow into you, but I want to flow out of you. I want you to be a river, a stream. I want you to be able to feed the hungry and bring the thirsty water. And so John, wanting us to understand this, tells us that Jesus has come that we may have life and we may have it more abundantly. Maybe it's not as abundant as we want it right now, but it, it's now, but not yet. And John tells us, and this is eternal life, that you may know Jesus, the only true God, and Jesus whom I've sent. And John captures the very essence of the gospel in his book when he says, for God so loved this world, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Jesus is our message.